Hey, good morning, everybody. How y'all doing today? Good. It is so good to see the few of you that came. Well, I'd love to invite you guys to stand up and sing with us this morning as we start the day worshiping the Lord. It's a glorious day. I was buried beneath my shame. Thank you guys so much. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Good. Well, you guys can have a seat. And so, happy uh, Independence Day and Fourth of July. Isn't it crazy to think how young the country is? 245 years. Man, it's unbelievable. And uh, just to stop and consider, like, the freedom and the opportunity that God has provided us. And, and I stop and consider and think the greatest act of sacrifice and freedom. Because freedom is not without cost. And what Jesus had done on the cross for you and I and for all of us here and even online is unbelievable to think. 
Uh, and Jesus says it this way. He says, there's no greater love than this, that somebody would lay their life down for their friends. And he said, that's what I'm going to do. And so of all the things we get to celebrate today, I just want to encourage you, the, the freedom to be in this country and the freedom uh, far greater is to know that Jesus Christ loves you with an unconditional, amazing love. So, hey, speaking of freedom, you know what's incredible we get to do? In 2020, so many things were postponed and stopped and we weren't able to move forward on. And so we are re-kicking off. People have asked about Hope Water Project. You may say, that's new to me, what is that? We run, and we run uh, to help bring wells in Africa. And these wells are implanted uh, over there, and around them villages are built, and the gospel is brought, and churches uh, are, are come forth, and it's unbelievable. And so July uh, 31st, we're doing a 5K. I've, have any of you ever done like a 5K, or are any of you the wild people that do marathons, like it's no big deal, and you're like, yeah, I've done like 17 marathons, and you're like, what? You know, uh, right? So, well, that's going on, and we'd love for you to be part of that or join that or just even support that. So you can check that out on our app. Uh, to sign up for that, or you can even just support that um, from a distance if you want to. If you're not like a huge fan of running, uh, but you want to support our runners, uh, you can do it that way too. So, well, hey, there's also going on, not only that too, I don't know if we can put it up there. Yep, Rock Your Family. That's going to be August 21st. It's going to be like a one-day retreat for the family to get together. Uh, we weren't able to do this last year. We're excited. We're able to do it this year. And just to bond, I mean, from canoeing together and activities together and just sharing some moments together. Because moments make memories, and memories remind you uh, of the privilege it is that, that you have family and what God does through that. And so we want to invite you to be part of that, okay? So today we are starting a new series, and I'm excited because uh, Cliff Johnson, our central teaching pastor, is going to be here. Uh, and I'm a little biased because I love Cliff and care about him a ton, but he's one of our sincerely best theologically trained Bible teachers. And so he is an expert when it comes to like narrative teaching and preaching, and he's going to step into... Uh, part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. We're going to look over of what that looks like, Jesus' family tree, over the next four weeks. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Because you think the Son of God must have come from an amazing family, right? Not exactly. <laughs> but it's so amazing how God works through some of the weakest parts of our family and ourselves and our family tree to do some of the most amazing things. Um, and I, it's so funny, growing up, uh, my wife had told me, she said when she was asked what her like heritage was when she was younger, she would say this. She goes, well, my mom's side's Italian, so I have Italian in me. My dad's side is hillbilly, so I'm hillbilly and Italian. <laughs> it's how she would share it, you know. Um, and I've got a little hillbilly in me too. So, uh, but, but it's interesting as we look at her family tree, and it, it's unique because there's part of our family tree that we're so proud of, right? Uh, my dad always told me about my uncle, uncle Butler that was six foot eight. He could throw a whole block of hay over his head like it was no big deal and ran a big farm. And then there's parts of our family tree we're not so proud of. And we're going to look at both today and we're going to in the middle of it explore that God's grace and God's goodness is always enough. And it's always moving and working through us. The best and brightest parts of who we are and, and the parts that don't shine so brightly. And so we've got a video to kind of have some fun and kind of move that way and say what would it look like? if we sat down and actually examined our family tree. Okay, I believe it's over here somewhere. It smells kind of funny, Grandpa. Well, old things have a tendency to do that. Wow, that's cool. You're asking about our family, our ancestors. I asked Dad, but he doesn't seem to remember a whole lot. I'm surprised. I'm pretty sure I showed him this stuff to him many times. There's a lot of old stories here. Who are these people? Well, let me see. Uh, this is from World War II. You see this man sitting right here? Yeah, who is he? That's your great-great-uncle Roy. Ever heard of him? No. What did he do? He was a pigeoneer. What? <laughs> He trained carrier pigeons to carry important messages to the soldiers in the Navy. What kind of messages? Oh, important ones about uh, enemy submarines. But uh, one day, Roy made a mistake. Instead of attaching an important piece of intel to the carrier pigeon, he attached a recipe for spam salad. What happened? Well, let's just say I hope they could swim well. This is so cool. Huh, let's see. Ah, this is a World War I victory medal in Siberia. This was given to your great-great-great-grandfather, Wendell. Isn't Siberia a long, long way from here? Mm, cold, too. Wendell was, uh, he's a bit odd. 
he went to Siberia by accident, got on the wrong boat. He thought he was headed to Greece to press his own olive oil. That's weird. That was Wendell. What's a patent? Uh, a patent is something you get when you invent something. Uh, your great Aunt Molly was an inventor. What did she invent? Uh, it says the car exhaust grill. What's a lawsuit? That's what you get when you invent the car exhaust grill. The Titanic? That would have been Arthur. The Chicago Fire. That was Bernice. Little Bighorn. That was George. What's a Watergate? You know what? Grandpa needs a nap. Besides, I'm pretty sure you're bored with looking at all these smelly old things. We can continue this in uh, some other time, like in 30 or 40 years. Won't you be dead by then? God willing. Who's Benedict Arnold? Oh, that is so great, isn't it? Our riff on National Treasure. And if we go deep enough into our family trees, we might not find some of the most glowing examples. I'm 100% Norwegian. So if you go all the way back, you get back to Leif Erikson, then further back, I think you get to, to Thor, uh, I believe, the Norse god of something. And uh, I jokingly say, uh, because I'm 100% Norwegian, I'm pretty tall, uh, I'm Thor if Thor let himself go, like in Avengers Endgame, when he looked like melted ice cream, if you're a fan of that. <laughs> you're laughing a little too hard, I think. I'm working on it. Anyway, but uh, we're excited to start this series. We're, we're excited to look at at Jesus' family tree. And it's interesting because if you think about the era we live in now, between 23andMe and Ancestry.com, and I'm sure there's others where you can legitimately send them like a drop of blood or whatever they ask you for, and they can do a DNA search on your family tree and kind of where you come from and country of origin and all that cool stuff. But I don't know if you've noticed in the news that it's kind of backfired on some people. Like they caught the Golden State Killer because he was curious about his heritage. And uh, so it put it into a database, the police found it, and it's like revived all these cold cases because people are unknowingly uh, going into a database that's able to be accessed by law enforcement. And so, uh, so anyway, just if you're a serial killer here today, just be careful uh, <laughs> where you search things out. Sorry, that's a bad joke. But uh, it's true, I'm sure there's a lot of relief to that family. But you know, when we look at the genealogy of Jesus, in this series we're focusing on Matthew 1 and, and, and his version of Jesus' genealogy, they're all just slightly different. And the reason they're slightly different is not because, you know, of, of any sort of incongruity between the text, but because different authors chose to highlight different people. I think it's so interesting that Matthew would highlight five women in Jesus' genealogy. Now today we're like, that's great, well, what's the big deal? But you have to understand in the first century when this was written, this was a big deal. Women were viewed as less in society, and especially the women that were chosen to be highlighted in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus were women that were, many of them are foreigners. One of them was a prostitute. The other one had a really bad thing happen to her named Bathsheba. I mean, there's, there's, there's some really interesting stories mixed in there. But when you look at what Matthew did for a living before he was a disciple of Jesus, does anyone remember what Matthew was? tax collector, all right? So now that would be kind of an IRS agent. We don't hate them maybe, I mean, we don't like them, but we don't hate them like in Jesus' day. Tax collectors were seen as a sellout to Rome, and the tax collector social circles, because they were so hated by their own people, they hung out with prostitutes and foreigners and those who were less than in society. So it's interesting that Matthew, who was charged with writing the gospel account to the Jewish people to prove that Jesus Christ was the Messiah they've been waiting for, he made some interesting editorial choices under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to press into the next few weeks. And so I think it's going to be really interesting as we do some character studies on these women. And so today we're going to press into the story of a woman by the name of Ruth. Ruth, she's listed in that genealogy. But before we do, I want to just invite you uh, to um, participate in a moment in our service uh, where we receive our offering. 
our offering. And so we believe that God has given us everything we have. Psalms 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That means even, even the things that we've acquired on our own, even the things that we think are ours, are actually God's. They actually belong to him in a very beautiful way. And so we see this as a time where we give back to God out of what he's given to us. Now, for some of you, uh, you might wonder, well, I've never done that before. I've heard churches do this. What's that all about? We believe this is an important part of following Jesus, an important part of discipleship. And so we've made it very simple for you to give. I mean, how many of us pay most of our bills online? Like right now, if I have to write a check for something, it's a 10-minute search for the checkbook. Anybody there besides me? I'm like, I think I saw it somewhere in the closet. Or uh, so, so much of what we do is electronic these days. And so we've made it as simple as we can to do that. Uh, you could give through your, your text message from your phone. You can go through our app or you can actually go to our website. But if you do want to write a check, you can mail one to our Troy campus. And there's also some buckets by the doors as well to do that. So we believe that giving back to God is a beautiful expression of all that he's done for us. But don't feel any pressure if you're a first-time attender or you're not sure. Um, but th those of you who are following Jesus, we invite you to take that next step in your discipleship with him. And it's interesting that we would talk about tithes and offerings today, to use the churchy term for it, because there's a part of the story in Ruth where something happens, I'm going to explain later, called gleaning. And this was a practice of giving above and beyond their normal tithes back to the Lord. So there is a giving element to the story, and believe it or not, it is the critical moment in an incredible love story. It all happens in a field, and it's pretty powerful and pretty beautiful. So as we step into it, I just want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you chose the unexpected or difficult way to show love and care for someone, even after you're offered a way out? So you've had a moment where it's like, hey, if you choose to do this, it's going to be a difficult road. It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of care. Have you ever had a moment like that, a decision to make like that, and the person's telling you, no, 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 you don't need to do this. No, I'm fine. Don't. You go. You live your life. Don't sweat it. Don't worry about it. But there was something inside of you that just said, no, I need to do this, even though it's going to be hard, even though it's going to be a huge commitment, even though it's going to take everything I have, I'm going to take this step of obedience and I'm going to follow and do that. It's a kindness. It's a love that puts the other's needs before your own. A few years ago, uh, in fact, it was the fall of 2015, my father, who lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Angela and I were living in upstate New York near Syracuse, and I was pastoring a church there, and uh, we were kind of living my wife's dream life, if I could be totally honest with you. She's very close to her parents. And she grew up in a town called Oswego, uh, which is right on Lake Ontario in upstate New York. Uh, Oswego State, which is a SUNY campus, State University of New York. Famously, Jerry Seinfeld went there for one semester. That's kind of the claim to fame. Other than that, there's Al Roker was from that area, or went there, I think, um, from the Today Show. So we were living there. We actually bought the house next to her parents. So it was on land that they had sold a few years before to help pay some bills. So we, in a sense, redeemed the land and brought it back into the family. And we lived, I mean, right next door. Now, it's a good thing I love them because there was no buffer zone, zero buffer. Um, but the girls would just run across to go see Mimi and Pop-Pop. And I think it was a pretty idyllic situation for my wife. For me, also good. But for her... I mean, that's got to be, that's a dream for her. So she loved it. But my dad got sick. And I was driving back and forth from New York to Grand Rapids to help him out. He was in the hospital. He had a, a near fatal bout of pancreatitis, which is a really, really dangerous thing. And he looked over at me from his hospital bed. And my mom had passed away several years before uh, of cancer. And so he's kind of on his own. And he looked over at me. And this is my dad, strong doesn't need anything from anybody normally, just a bootstrap, got it done on his own, independent. And he looked at me, and he said, will you come out and take care of me? Now, he claimed later it was the Dilaudid that talked, <laughs> the pain meds. But at the time, it seemed very sincere, and he was sincere, I joke. So I was like, wow, Dad, I got to think about that. And so I drove back to New York, and I sat down with Angela and said, my dad asked if we'd be willing to move out there. And take care of him. 
Now think about what that would mean for her. This would mean leaving this church. And by the way, I, I stepped in after Angela's dad needed to retire because he got a liver transplant. So this is the church they had led. We're living next door. And I just said, babe, I kind of want you to make this decision because you're leaving a lot. And she said, I think this is what we need to do. And so we rented our house out and we left that church and we moved to Grand Rapids and moved into my dad's basement, which when I drew up the future of my life and my dreams, I didn't think I'd be living in my dad's basement when I was 40, but a little different situation, but I was down there. But my wife showed him such kindness. In fact, in Hebrew, there's a word for kindness, a loving kindness that is self-sacrificial, that is putting others' needs first, that is so faithful and beautiful. It's called hesed, hesed. In the New Testament, Paul used a word for love that's agape. We've talked about here. I'm sure you've talked about it. It's like that sacrificial, unconditional love. This is sort of the Hebrew equivalent of that. My wife cooked the meals for my dad every day. Special diet he had to be on. She'd run to the grocery store, make him meals. And anyone who knows my story, she has her own health struggles. And she's had two kidney transplants. And she pushed herself to care for him. And I had a front row seat to watch this happen. But what's so interesting is that you're going to see in the story of Ruth and even in the story with my wife and family, sometimes when we do that hard thing and we choose the narrow road and we put someone else's needs above our own, and my dad told me, he offered us a way out. He's like, listen, I know it's a lot. You don't have to come. We said, no, 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 Dad, we're still coming. Then he called me again. He's like, hey, you don't have to come. It's okay. We're like, Dad, no, we're coming. We're going to do this thing. So to even overcome those objections... I have found that when we do that, there's something that God is doing on the other side of it that we have no way of knowing, but it's something we've always dreamed about. It's like our deepest desires are found on the other side of our most radical obedience. And I believe that's the heart of the story of Ruth. In Matthew 1.5, we get the actual genealogy that contains Ruth. It says, now this word is pronounced salmon, but if you want to say salmon, I'm not going to say anything about it, okay? I know you're hungry. All right, so Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Now, next week, you're going to look at the story of Rahab, who was literally a prostitute who God used to save his people. This is Boaz's mother, was named Rahab. And this is where we see the name of Ruth. All right, so a little bit of backstory here. Um, we're going to go into Ruth chapter 1 in a second. But the backstory here is that a man by the name of Elimelech and Naomi were living in Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. That Bethlehem. They were in it. And it was a small town. But a severe famine hit so bad that they actually sold off their family inheritance. And they took their young sons, their two little boys whose names were Malon and Killian, and they moved 50 miles away over rugged, treacherous, mountainous terrain to a, a land called Moab, a land called Moab. So two little boys, Naomi and, let me get this name right, Elimelech, thank you, Eli. Can we call him Eli? Would that be better? Great. Eli and Naomi went. All right, and they went over there. But this famine was devastating. And so when they got there, tragically, Elimelech, passed away and left Naomi as a widow. But her two sons actually found and married two Moabite women. Now you've got to know the Moabites were not a part of God's chosen people. They were seen as idolatrous. They were seen as evil. They were seen as very perverse and just a, a people that God told his own people to steer clear of. A very bad influence. And yet Naomi's two sons married two Moabite women. They married them. One was named Ruth, and the name Ruth means friendship. The other one named, was named Orpah, not Oprah, Orpah, which means stubborn, and Naomi's name means pleasant. All right, so, but just for a moment, will you put yourself in their shoes, because what happened next is so stunning, because Ruth and Orpah are married to Naomi's sons, and after they were both married to them for 10 years, no children have been born, which in that, again, at that time in that culture, those women were seen as less than, that something was wrong with them because of that. 
so much of their worth was defined by their husband and their children. But after 10 years, we don't know what happened, but both of the sons died. So you've got Naomi. She's been widowed. Both of her sons have now passed away. And you've got Naomi, you've got Orpah, and you've got Ruth all together. And Naomi's trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do? Now, Ruth and Orpah, because they were married to her sons, they were bound to Naomi. So her fate was going to be their fate. They needed to come together and stay with her. So look what happens. Naomi comes up with a plan and decides she needs to release these girls and let them go live their lives. Because I know in your mind you're thinking, well, these these girls must be in their mid-30s or so if they've been married 10 years. But remember, go way back. They would have gotten married as teenagers at this time. So they were mid, early to mid-20s, more than likely. Had a lot of life left to live. And so Naomi, in Ruth 1 verse 8, says this. She said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you've shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. That was a little harsh, I feel like. Anyway, may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. So she's releasing them, saying, hey, you've been kind to me. And that word there for kindness, loving kindness, is that word chesed that we talked about. You've shown me such sacrificial love and kindness. I release you to go find new husbands, go back to your mom and dad's house, and leave. But here's what happened. Naomi's releasing them, even though they're bound to her. And she says it once, and they both say no. Orpah gives her a big kiss and says, no, no, no. And... And Ruth clings to her, says, no. Well, then Naomi repeats it again, says, no, seriously, I want you to leave. You need to go. And at that point, Orpah, whose name means stubborn, wasn't very stubborn. She gave her a kiss and peaced out. She headed back to Moab. She's like, all right, I'm out. But Ruth refused to do that. She refused. She hung on to her and she said, no, 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 I'm not leaving you. And listen to what she says in verse 16. It's so beautiful. She says, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Here's what I love about this. She is saying, stop asking. Now, if you've ever had, like, the polite fight for a check, maybe at a restaurant, where it's like, no, 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 I got it. And you're like, no, 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 I've got it. There's kind of a battle of wills that happens there. And depending on your relationship, sometimes there's trickery, like, you find the waiter, you go to the bathroom and find the waiter and deal with it without even the check arriving. But my wife and I have a three times rule, where we're like, if someone's like, you know, no, we don't want you to pay for it. We're going to pay. We're like, no, 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 we're going to pay. And then they go a second time. No, no, no we're going to pay. We say, no, no, we really want to pay. And then if they go a third time, we say, fine. Because at that point, it's getting awkward a little bit, isn't it? Now we're like fighting over the check, and that's not cool. But three times. So Orpah gets to two and is gone because she's out. But what I love about Ruth is it gets to the third time. She's like, no, no, no. Not only am I not going to stop, but you need to stop asking. Please stop telling me to leave you behind because I'm with you until the end. Now remember, she's from Moab, an idolatrous nation that did not follow the God of Israel. And yet she says, your God is my God. I'm going to follow you. And even death is not going to separate us, whatever that means. I think it just meant that their fates, she was sewing together their lives and their fates. What I love about this, when you look at the path that she chose here, there was a wide path that was, okay, I'm out. I'm going back to my own people, find another husband, go to my mom and dad's house and start over. Maybe that's the path that Orpah took. And then there was this narrow road, this narrow path. And this is the one that Ruth chose, literally chose. It was 50 months, because Naomi said, I'm going back to Bethlehem. I've heard that the famine is over. I think I have family there. I've been gone a long time, but I'm going back. Now, the trip back to Bethlehem was a legitimately narrow road and dangerous path, 50 miles over rugged and treacherous terrain. And Naomi was going to make that trip on her own. As an older widowed, as an older widow, that's not a great idea, is it? So Ruth is going to protect her and walk with her. I want to read a verse to you that's been huge in my life. 
when it comes to making big decisions, when it comes to sort of those, those crossroads moments where you can make two decisions, have you ever had one of those moments? It's found in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. It's not on the screen. I'm just going to read it for you. Thus saith the Lord, stand by the roads or stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient path where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. When it's Jeremiah 6, 16. When it's talking about the ancient path, Jesus later refers to it as the narrow way, the narrow road, the road that leads to life. Literally in Israel, if you go to, for instance, Mount Carmel, if you, if you know your Old Testament a little bit, you remember that Elijah had this big moment on the top of Mount Carmel. What's amazing is they preserved the ancient path up Mount Carmel. Generation after generation has painted these little semicircles up the pathway on trees and on rocks to show you this is the way that Elijah went. Now, why does that matter? Because on the backside of Mount Carmel is a wide paved road for air-conditioned tour buses to go up to the same spot. And the first time I went, it was 119 degrees in northern Israel, and we went up the ancient path. <laughs> and I knew every time I was like, you know, I'm, I was in similar shape in 2007, unfortunately. And so I was going up there, and I would stop and be like, I don't know if I can keep going. And I didn't know anything about this ancient past stuff. And I look up, and I see these little pink, like a little white and a black stripe of paint on a rock. And I'd be like, that's weird. I wonder what that's for. And I would move up, and I'd get to that, and I would take another breather. And then I would see another one. See, and it literally led me up the mountain, gave me encouragement. And I got to the top, and I brought it up to our teacher and said, what did that mean? He said, that was the markings of the ancient path. And what's amazing is... I remember that day. I remember that moment. Do you notice how well you remember every detail where you, your life takes the ancient path versus when you maybe took the easy way out? This is Ruth saying, I am choosing at the crossroads to follow you on a literal rugged terrain ancient path because that's how I'm going to show you this kindness, this has said, and this love for you. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of that. So, we're going to keep rolling. So she, they arrive. I'm going to summarize some of this for the sake of time. So they arrive back into Bethlehem. Now, Naomi was from Bethlehem. This is the same Bethlehem that is so famous as the birthplace of Jesus Christ. And so she arrives back in Bethlehem, and people start whispering, wait a minute, is this Naomi? Now, Facebook was not around back then. There was no way of tracking things or looking up people you went to high school with to see what they're up to now. This was it. Your face was literally the social media piece. And so when she came back, people were like, I mean, she'd been gone for at least 10 years, but probably more like 20. So she comes back, and the rumors and the buzzing is like, is this Naomi? She's back. And they say, Naomi, are you here? And remember, the name Naomi means pleasant. And she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, which means bitter. So that was her entrance. <laughs> so she was just feeling very, she was struggling. And she was low and she was hurting because of all the things that had happened. The pain she was in and the hurt. So when they arrive, Ruth steps into a leadership role and says, let me go get us some food. Let me go step in and help take care of you. And so she went to a field where some workers were harvesting and reaping wheat and other things. And she was able to do that. Here's what's so unique. She's a widow. She's a foreigner. And yet there was this, this process called gleaning. And this was something that God required of his people to care for orphans, widows, aliens, strangers, those who were struggling. That when you have, and, and being in Israel recently, if you fly over certain parts of northern Israel, you will see it looks like a patchwork quilt from the plane. It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. And what they are is one acre family plots. And they've got sometimes fences or rocks dividing them. But you look, some of these plots are beautiful. The big giant rectangle, and you can see things. Around. Other ones are rocky and haven't been cared for. But God required of his people through the law to bring 10% of their harvest in to give back to him as a tithe. That's what we did a few minutes ago. But above and beyond that, he asked them, he commanded them, to leave the very corners of their fields. So here is, you know, you got four corners here, and just the corners need to be left. Now, here's what's interesting. Technically, the corner could just be one stalk of wheat, right? That's the actual corner. So it wasn't the presence of the corner that made you generous. It was how big a corner you left 
for the poor to come and gather. So the poor would then come and they would work right behind your workers and they would pick up things that they dropped and they would cut down the corners and then they would have enough to live on. It was a beautiful way that this society cared for each other. And because it was an agricultural and agrarian society, they knew that sometimes, sometimes Jeremiah's plot of land that's down in the valley, boy, sometimes the weather's weird and it didn't rain and he, had a, he did not have a good crop. But mine up on the hillside, boy, I don't know what happened, but it is just bountiful. So he comes up with his family because he needs to eat. So my generosity is literally helping Jeremiah survive. Because I don't know if next year I'm going to need Jeremiah to provide for me. Isn't it a beautiful picture, though, of how God designed us to take care of each other in that way? It's so sweet. I know it's just a part of the story, but I just love you to hear that and think through how God has designed these systems of generosity for us to care for each other. And so it's in that moment. Ruth goes, again, early to mid-20s. Everything in the text seems to suggest she's beautiful and she's hardworking. And we already know about her character and integrity. It is up here. She is a godly, amazing woman. And so what happens? She's gleaning in this field. And look at Ruth 2.3. It says, so she, being Ruth, went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So I love the, the, the actual original Hebrew, which is what this was written in originally, translates, instead of it saying, as it turned out, it literally goes, as her chance chanced. <laughs> in other words, like, what a coincidence, wink, wink. Like, something's happening. She's in this guy's field. This is just the field she picked. She didn't know who he was. But God was up to something because Boaz was someone very significant. And the story was about to unfold in a powerful and a beautiful way. So as she's gleaning, Boaz shows up. He shows up and immediately he goes, who's that? <laughs> I love it. I'm going to summarize this part because there's a lot of verses in between. And he asked the foreman of his field, he goes, who is that over there? He's like, give me, I need the details here. And he's like, well, and then he runs down the list of things that she is and who she is and where she's from and what she's doing. But something has happened. The more I study this, the more most scholars believe that there's such clunky language used by the foreman trying to describe something. The best translation was, uh, something kind of happened, and then she went and took a rest. So the belief is, because of what Boaz says, that she was maybe harassed by one of Boaz's workers um, and later they allude to these widows, especially if they're young and beautiful, were very subject to, to assault, harassment, and just it was dangerous for them, which, which totally makes sense. Um, in that culture and even today, it, it could be a dangerous thing. So Boaz finds this out and he addresses her. And it's really amazing because it turns out that Boaz was a part of the same tribe, the same family as Naomi's husband. So this is a relative, all right, which is pretty incredible. And so he finds out, Boaz finds out that this beauty, he doesn't know this yet. He just sees Ruth and he's like, who is that? I need to know everything about her. Some things have never changed, right, guys? Anyway, so verse 8 says, so Boaz says to Ruth, my daughter, again, not his literal daughter, but just referring to her as a young woman, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. See what I'm saying? That might be. Not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you noticed me, a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of, of your husband how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. I love this because what does he do here? He offers protection. He offers provision. He offers special treatment to her. He offers favor and grace. And she just wants to know why. Why? Why are you singling me out? And what I love that he says is, I have heard your story. 
the hesed, the kindness, he uses that word, that you've shown to your widowed mother-in-law, we've all heard the story, and you are clearly have high character and incredible kindness, and I pray that God blesses you for that. Isn't that amazing how in this moment, here's this Boaz is a wealthy landowner who has compassion in his heart. He sees Ruth. He's moved by her beauty. He hears her story. Now he's moved by her story. And then he's going to now provide for her and for her mother-in-law through his incredible generosity and kindness. He's showing her has said kindness and love because she showed has said when nobody required it and no one expected it. It's a beautiful picture. So she came home from her first day of gleaning, and she has got a lot of grain. She's got food left over from this incredible meal. She hung out with Boaz and all the workers, and she comes home to Naomi, and Naomi responds like this. Where did this come from? It actually says, and Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, of one of our, he's one of our redeemers. So in other words, she's like, okay, I know all this stuff you had. You did not, you're not like the world's fastest gleaner or worker. Although she did work all day, she's like, who noticed you? Who showed you favor? And Ruth says, his name is Boaz. And it's like Ruth, or excuse me, Naomi, just like the light bulb went on and she snapped out of her funk that she was in where she was bitter and changing her name. And she's like, wait, something's going on. Something so much bigger than we can even believe. Because you have to understand, Boaz is part of my family. It's like she remembered something that she had forgotten. She didn't tell her to go to Boaz's field. She just said, she just said okay when she wanted to go out. Now she realized this man is one of our redeemers. Redeemers. It's super interesting because this word for redeemer, this is ga'al in Hebrew. Ga'al. All right, it's spelled G-O-E-L, but it's pronounced with G-A-L. This is interesting. A redeemer in an extended family was like a superhero. This redeemer was a big deal because what he could do, there were four things that a redeemer could do. Number one, he can avenge any bloodshed that happened to someone. So if someone did something, he was the guy going to settle the score. Second thing he could do is he could redeem or buy back the land that somebody in his family lost due to poverty or a bad deal. He can go and buy it back for a fair price. The third thing the redeemer can do or a kinsman redeemer can do in the family is he can buy a family member out of slavery, redeem them from slavery. And, in, and there's several in this story that we're going to see him do. The fourth thing he can do is he can actually marry a widow within his family so that he revives the family line. And this is not even optional. This is a requirement of the Redeemer to be willing to step in and to right these wrongs. And so think about it. When Naomi realizes, wait, this is Boaz. He's a Redeemer in our family. He can buy back the land that we lost. He might even be able to marry my daughter-in-law and give her a child and extend our family line. So Naomi comes up with a plan. Because Ruth is working all day, every day, and Boaz is such a gentleman and so kind, he's not making the moves. All right? He's not sensing that there is a vibe happening here, and he needs to ask her out for the first time or do something. So Naomi takes things into her own hands and says, okay, Ruth, here's what you're going to do. Tonight, after Boaz has eaten and he's had some drinking done. I don't know how much drink, but they had wine back then. So when he's real, like, ready to rest, they would sleep on the threshing floor because part of it was wheat. And if you remember uh, some of the stuff, the way they would do wheat is they would throw it all up in the air. They would, th they would use these special things to thresh or to separate the wheat from the chaff. And they'd throw it in the air, and the kernels would fall, and the, others, the stalks and things would float away in the wind. This was a very labor-intensive process, and it was a very crime-ridden process because if you left all of your kernels of wheat on the threshing floor unguarded, someone could come and steal it in the night. So Naomi knew that Boaz would sleep on the threshing floor next to the piles of wheat that they've been gathering for the seven weeks of harvest. She said, okay, go to him in the night, around midnight, come to him quietly, and then uncover his feet, and then lay there quietly. Now, I don't know about anybody out there, but, like, 
I keep my feet covered when I sleep and my legs, but my wife likes to have one leg out when she sleeps. I'll never understand it. But if somebody uncovered my feet and it was chilly, I'd be like, hey, what's going on here? My piglets are getting cold. So in the Hebrew, it's, it's either feet or even like lower legs. So maybe up to like, you know, kept it modest below the knee. But anyway, she, she removes that. And then she just lays next to him, like right next to him, either at his feet or, or by his side. And so in the middle of the night, he notices this and he opens his eyes and he rolls over. He goes, ah, who are you? Literally, it's like me when my daughters come to me at like 3 in the morning because they had a bad dream and they just stand over me and tap my forehead. It's like every scary movie I've ever seen has small children and I'm like, why me? I mean, half the time I just go, what do you need, sweetie? I love you. What's wrong? Forgive daddy. You scared the life out of me. So that's Boaz, just not with the horror movie piece because I hadn't made those yet. But anyway, so he says, what, who are you? She goes, I'm Ruth. And she explains who she is following the blueprint of the plan that Naomi had laid out for her. And in that, she says, I want you to cover me with the corner of your wing, which is super interesting language. Um, and since he was a Kingsman Redeemer, he was, he was Hawkman. No, I'm just kidding, that's not funny. Uh, no, because of, it, was, it was language that was used to describe, I'm up for marriage if you are. Pretty forward, yes. It just seems like Boaz needed a little kick in the pants. Any guys out there that needed the, the, the uh, girl you're dating or with to kind of take the lead on some of these things because you weren't really tracking with it? Okay, I see those hands that were not raised. Um, so she kind of takes the lead. And he says to her in verse 12, he says, this is incredible kindness before we get to 12. The kindness you've shown me right now, the hesed, you've shown me right now is greater than the first kindness you showed me. And he says, you could have found a younger man your age, but you chose me? I mean, I love this guy. Isn't he great? And he says, but there's a catch. He said, although it is true, verse 12, that I am a guardian redeemer, kinsman redeemer of your family, there is another who is more closely related than I am. So although I know I'm a ga'al, there's someone between me and you. And so he, the next day, now, here's how amazing he is. Obviously, this situation is charged with potential controversy. This widow, oh, by the way, part of Naomi's plan also was that Ruth would take a bath and put on some nice clothes and kind of, and perfume, it said. Which some say she was like kind of getting ready to woo him. But more importantly, it showed that she was changing out of her mourning outfit and changing into an outfit that said, my time of mourning is over. I am now single and ready to mingle, is the actual Hebrew there. <laughs> Just kidding. But that's sort of true. So he says, hold on. You need to go before daylight and go back home. I don't want anyone in town getting the wrong idea. Because nothing happened. Why? Because Boaz is a man of integrity and so is Ruth. Nothing untoward happened. But he sends her home with a bunch of grain. I mean, literally, she was crushing it on the grain department with Boaz. I mean, within seven weeks, she would have had enough to live on for a year based on the math. So she goes home to Ruth. Or Ruth goes home to Naomi and says, here's what he gave me. And, of course, Naomi's dying to know how this all went. And she's like, well, that's great, but let's see how this works out. So it says that Boaz went to the city gates where he found the kinsman redeemer that was closer like first in line, we'll say, the one whose responsibility it was. So he says to him, hey, are you ready to step in and be the Gael for this family? And he said, there's a piece of land that used to belong to Elimelech, and you could buy that back. And the guy's like, yes, real estate holdings, I'm in, I'll do it. Where do I sign? And he goes, that's great, just one more thing. The dead husband's wife is part of the deal. It's basically how he says it. Not really the most glowing endorsement of Ruth, but you could tell he's sort of wanting to sour this deal. The guy goes, oh, wait a minute. No thanks. You keep it. And then to seal the deal, he took off his sandal and gave it to him. Which isn't really how we close real estate transactions now. At least not when I've done it, but that would be fun. Um, so he basically steps in. He does it the right way. There's all these witnesses. And now he goes back to Ruth. They get married. It's a beautiful story. And then you see in, in uh, chapter 4, verse 21, Salmon, otherwise known as Salmon, 
the father of Boaz, Boaz, the father of Obed, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. Ruth now is part of the royal line of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? So she marries Boaz, and Boaz, by the way, is the son of Rahab, a foreign prostitute. Now he marries an, a foreigner himself from Moab, but this foreigner, just like Rahab, they followed the God of Israel, and they had integrity, and they had character, and they did things to preserve this beautiful family line. And a couple generations later, born David, then Solomon, and then Jesus. It's an incredible, incredible story. He had integrity, and he found his wife. Now, what I want to encourage you with as we think about this story is there's a verse in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, and it says this. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful or will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. This is the idea that God has started something in each one of us. God is writing an incredible story in each of us. And when we step into moments and we show people that kindness, that love, that has said to someone else, we do that because it's the right thing to do, because it's what we feel like God's asking us to do, because it's what he did for us through Jesus Christ. We want to show that to someone else. How often is it that that's part of our story, that God's now going to use that to bring about our greatest desire or the next major step in our life is on the other side of that obedience and that kindness that has said in our family, we went to take care of my dad. My wife is making him meals, showing him unbelievable kindness. I was taking him out to walk him around the neighborhood to get his exercise because he just was, had been so sick. We thought it was going to be a year, year and a half recovery. And in six months, he was better. So after a few months, we started realizing, well, I can't live in my dad's basement forever. So I need to find a job somewhere. And so it was in that season that I reached out to Kensington Church. And Kensington Church said, you don't know this, but our Birmingham pastor's resigning. No one knows this. And, and my resume arrived on the day that he resigned. And they jokingly say, my resume came in like this, just from the sky. <laughs> it just fell in front of them. I'm like, I wish I could work that out. That'd be fun. Um, and so I went and I spent four plus years at the Birmingham campus, which was such a joy and such a gift to lead those people. But here's what's really incredible is that we have two adopted daughters, Lily and London, that we love so much. Well, they had a, a third, a little sister that was born in the fall of 2015 when we still lived in New York and are just moving to Grand Rapids. And, she, and she's in this area. And what's incredible is, once we moved back to this Birmingham area, we're nearby. My wife had been praying and praying and praying since before this child was born that God would allow us to adopt her and keep all three sisters together. But it just didn't happen. It didn't happen. We lived too far away. We lived too far away. We lived too far away. It just wasn't working. Well, once we moved into town, we kept praying and kept praying. And all of a sudden, we got the call to adopt this little beauty. But what's amazing is, it wasn't, we didn't do the thing with my dad to get that result that has said that my wife showed to my dad was purely based on love with no ulterior motives at all. And we live several hours away. But if, if she hadn't done that, the deepest desire of her and my heart to have this beautiful child in our lives would have never happened. At least we can't imagine another route for it to happen. So God was so good to use that moment where we did something like him to then say, well, that's the next step for, us to, for me to give you what you've always wanted. And I don't know where you find yourself today. Maybe you're at a crossroads today and you don't know which way to go. My advice and my, I just implore and encourage you, take the ancient path. Follow the way of Jesus. If it's a hard way, but that's the way of integrity and character and kindness and love and has said, you take that path, you're not going to regret it. Because that path requires you to depend on God for every step of the way. Whereas that wide road can seem easier and it can seem self-sufficient and we can miss maybe what God had for us if we follow him on that narrow road. So do you want to ride up the back of Mount Carmel on a tour bus with air conditioning on a blacktop road? 
Or do you want to go up the front of it, 119 degrees, seeing those little symbols that were put there since the time of Elijah and say, keep going, it's worth it. Keep pressing on, it's worth it. Show others the kindness that's been shown to you. Show others the love that's been shown to you. Will you give others what God has given to you? And how many times is the deepest desire of your heart on the other side of that sort of risk and devotion to follow him? How many times is that dream of yours actually awaiting you at the end of that ancient path? That's part of our story. I'm sure it's part of your story out there. And for those of you who haven't done that, it will be and it can be part of your story. Because God knows you. He loves you. And even when we don't see it, he's working. And even when you don't feel it, he's working. Ruth had no idea that saying yes to taking care of Naomi was saying yes to a future beyond her wildest dreams where she would have a child and be part of the line of Jesus Christ. He knows you and he loves you. God, I thank you for this truth today. I thank you for the life of Naomi and, and Ruth. I thank you for that incredible example. I pray even now that we would, all of us in this room, would recognize that you know us and that you love us and you have a plan for us. And that your plan is moving forward. And that you have started a good work and you're going to bring it to completion because you're faithful, you're kind. You've shown us the ultimate picture of hesed and of agape love. Thank you that we are loved by you. In Jesus' name. Just as I am, you welcome me. With open arms, how can this be? My guilt is undone, my past is untethered.
we thank you for such an incredible, immaculate love that you truly do know us. And you know what's best for us and you've laid incredible things before us to walk with you, even in the unknown, Lord. We know that you promise good. And we know that all of the promises you have made, you will keep, you will fulfill. And we know that they are good because you are good. You are faithful to the very end and we will rest in that, Lord. And we know that even when we can't see it, when we can't feel it, God, we know you're working on our behalf. We know you're doing something. And we thank you and celebrate you for that, Lord. We love you. Amen. I'm gonna do one last song called Yes and Amen. And I know you guys know this one, so I'm gonna invite you to stand and sing with us as we just worship and celebrate the goodness of our God. That his promises are good, that they are true and they are worthy of putting all of our faith and our confidence in because there is nothing better than our good God. So come on, let's sing this out together.
what a beautiful way to start Fourth of July. And man, Cliff, thank you so much. Don't you guys love his teaching, man? I, I really do. I love you. I always tell him he's like built like a grizzly bear, but inside the heart of a teddy bear. <laughs> I can say that because we're friends, man. But no, I, I love you, bud. Thank you so much for reminding us. It's amazing that Jesus Christ works when we're willing to be humble and obedient and trust him. He's always working in the bend of the river in ways that we can never imagine, hope or desire. But I, that's our prayer for this place for the next several weeks, several months. God, do something so great among us that we can't help but say, Jesus did this. Only he could have orchestrated and coordinated this because he is faithful. Man, we love you. God bless you. Have an incredible 4th of July. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing to you, let us know. God bless. We love you. Bye.